and Annie Dettino. Welcome to my living room. <laughs> very nice to see you, Lisa. It's very nice to see you. I wish we were at MetLife Stadium right now watching some New York Giants football, but unfortunately, we are quarantined in hell right now. Indeed we are, but uh, there is a draft coming up in two weeks, which a lot of people are really looking forward to because it will be a distraction from all this insanity. Absolutely. Well, we're going to get into the draft, but I'm going to do a little bit of an interview that you're not used to. Because okay. we're going to promote this through a lot of New York Giants outlets and everything. I want them to get to know Paul. Uh-oh. So you're going to ask my daughter questions? <laughs> well, maybe I got to do that separately. You get out of here. <laughs> he doesn't need any space time anyway. No, uh, no. So, Paul, you have been a mainstay in New York Giants media for decades. I don't want to make you sound old, but... It's I'm okay. I'm about to start my 38th season. How did you get started in sports broadcasting? Well, um, my plan all along when I came out of high school was to go to Fordham University because they had the radio station there, WFUV. And in my opinion, it was the best college radio station in the New York metro area. And I determined from listening to their sports talk show and their games and everything that they were doing and knowing that they had a tradition and a history there, it was like, if you really want to do this, you're either going to have to go up to Syracuse, which, as you know, they've got a long list of sportscasters, too, or you go to Fordham. My third choice would have been Seton Hall because they had a really good college radio station as well. But I had decided I wasn't going to move up to Syracuse. It's too cold there. Did not want any part of that. Uh, and so I decided that Fordham was going to be my first choice and Seton Hall was going to be my second choice. And from being able to go to Fordham, that was the whole key because their sports department was so well respected. It was treated so much like a professional station that when I got there, I initiated contact with the Giants, told them that I wanted to be a beat reporter and to cover the team and cover practices on a weekly basis. And they allowed me to do that with the stipulation that as long as I conducted myself professionally, that I would be able to continue to do so. If I did not, then like other college media, uh, I would not be permitted to do that. So I knew what was going to take, and that's why I did it. People watching that maybe want to get into sports, do you think that someone could pull that kind of deal off now in 2020? Very difficult to say, Lisa. I think in a lot of ways, media opportunities have opened up because of the internet and because of the kind of stuff that you're doing right here. So the opportunities are there to maybe try to explore and, and work on your craft. The problem is so many of these opportunities don't necessarily put money in your pocket. And so, you know, at a time when I came in, if, if you were fortunate enough to forge your way into the business, you may not make a lot of money at the start, but at least you could make something. Now, a lot of people who are doing uh, internet-based type of programming are doing things basically for a pretty smile and a couple of pennies, if that. And, and it's more experience than it is, you're, gonna, you're not just not going to be able to make money off of it. So it's a double-edged sword. Opportunities there, but you also got to eat. Yeah, and there's a lot more competition too. No question. Absolutely. Okay, so you broke in with the Giants. They gave you that sweet deal. Now you're working for them at the start of the 80s glory period. To be honest, when I started, I was, I was working at, at FUV, the, the school station, and I was covering the beat for them. After that, I went to the Connecticut Radio Network because they were based up in, in Connecticut and they had the, the network of New England under the, uh, the Giants banner. And the fellow who did their pre and post game shows did not wish to drive down to East Rutherford to do his pregame show interviews every week. And because I was already covering the team at Fordham, he said to me, well, when you get out of school, what are you doing? And I said, well, I hope I'm going to keep covering the Giants, but when I graduate, I don't have a connection and I don't know if I'm going to be able to continue living my dream. And he said, well, what if you did the pregame show interviews for us? Because I really don't want to drive down here from Connecticut every single week to do our pregame show audio. And I said, you got to be kidding me. He goes, no, I'm serious. And so they gave me a small stipend 
And that's how I got my first professional job of actually covering the Giants, doing pregame show interviews for the Connecticut Radio Network. That's where that actually started, where I started collecting checks. Because when I was at WFUV, I wasn't collecting checks for it, but I treated it as professionally as I could. Wow, that's a story. So then from there, how did you get in to even being closer to the team? Well, from there, uh, we, we move on. Um, I was doing that for, for a couple of years. And then um, after that, uh, the WFAN people, uh, they were shifting some of their personnel around. And it just so happens that, you know, covering the Giants as I was, I had experience on the beat. I was already established. I was a few years in. And I wound up basically kept banging on their door. I was doing devil's coverage for them in hockey. I was covered some Seton Hall basketball. I covered some uh, New Jersey Nets basketball for them as a stringer. And I said to them, well, you know, I've been doing the Giants for several years for other people. Uh, what about maybe doing it for you? And they had had some shuffling going on with their lineup. And they decided that, indeed, they were going to have me do it. So they hired me to be their Giants B reporter. At the same time, WNEW was expanding their pregame and postgame radio shows on game day. As luck would have it, the fan hired me during the week to do beat reporting on the Giants. The Giants at WNEW hired me to produce the Bob Papa pregame and postgame shows. So I was working for WNEW on game day, and I was working for WFAN during the week. No matter how you cut it, I was covering the Giants six days a week. And, oh. and that's, that's really where things started to pick up steam and the snowball started going downhill. Yeah, and you and Bob went to college together too. We did. Bob and I were, were, were classmates at Fordham University at WFUV. He was my sports director. I was one of his two assistants with Jack Curry who obviously does the Yankees with yes. And um, when, when, when WNEW, Bob had been there for a short time already as a sports guy, and they decided to enhance their pre- and post-game Giants programming, uh, and they needed someone to produce Bob's shows. So Bob told the guy who was in charge over there, his name was Gary Brandt, he said, Gary, uh, we got to bring some people in to do this, and I know a guy who would be really great. Uh, you need to talk to him. I don't know if you're going to hire him, but you need to talk to him. And so they brought in five people for interviews, and I got the job. So it was funny. As I said, I was working for two stations uh, simultaneously during the same season, but my responsibilities were clearly defined based on the day of what was going on. So what year was that? That would have been uh, 1989. Oh, okay. All right. So after the first Super Bowl. Yeah, in, in 86, uh, I was with the Connecticut Radio Network, and I actually had to get tickets to the game, and I flew out there on my own, and I sat in the stands because they did not want to take the expense to send me out there. So even though I was their, their pregame uh, uh, audio compiler and I got interviews for them, they did not wish to put up the money to send me to Pasadena. I did cover the playoffs for them, though. I was at the, uh, obviously, the championship game against the Washington Redskins. You know, I was, I was there for that. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know, the playoff run. But the Super Bowl, they did not want to send me. And I was not going to be denied. So I decided I was going to buy tickets and pay my own way to go. And that's exactly what I did. So I was there. And I was, sitting, uh, I was sitting about halfway up the bowl on the Giants' side, right on the goal line where Phil McCocky was waving his towel before the, uh, the uh, opening national anthem, and he knocks over the pylon. And, and if that doesn't give you enough of a picture, uh, I was on the goal line where George Martin sacked John Elway for the safety just before wow. the end of the first Wow. Wow. That's so awesome. So let's fast forward now. The 90 Super Bowl, you went, you didn't have to pay your way, did you? No, the 90 Super Bowl, I was Bob Papa's producer. Okay. And so I was in Tampa. And uh, we did the whole, the whole deal, pregame, postgame show. And I was in the stadium. And, in fact, I was sitting in George Young's seat in the press box. George, George did not like to sit in director's chairs. And, unfortunately, uh, the Tampa press box at the old sombrero was not 
very large and not very accommodating. And so they had had a suite and they, in this suite, they had set up about, I don't know, eight to 10 director's chairs that they were going to make do with press people and also George Young and Harry Humes, who was the assistant general manager. Well, George sees the setup and he goes, I can't sit there. I'm not sitting in those director's chairs. You guys find me somewhere else to go. So him and Harry were given seats somewhere else in that multi-level box that was at the stadium. And I had talked to one of the, the, the you know, press people who was with the NFL, and I said, our radio booth is so scrunched and so tight, and I do pre- and post-game. I'm not involved in the game broadcast. It's really not going to do any good to have me try to squish my way in there. It's not going to help anybody. He goes, well, George Young just gave up his director's chair in the, in, the other, in the other room in the press box. Would you like to sit in his chair? We can give it to you. I said, absolutely. Why not? So I sat in George Young's press seat in his director's chair for that Super Bowl. It was pretty remarkable. And that was a crazy Super Bowl, huh? It really was because the sombrero press box was so high on such an angle, I could not see Scott Norwood's field goal attempt. When, oh. when, when he kicked the ball, I was more looking down because it was a very high press box. The angle was really steep. So – I'm looking more down on the field than sideways. So I lost the ball. So when he kicked it, I was looking at the line of scrimmage, and I focused my eyes on Roger Brown, on Everson Walls, and on Myron Guyton, who were part of the field goal block team. And as soon as Norwood kicked it, they turned around, and they started to jump up and down. And that's how I knew he missed it, because I could not follow the track of the ball unbelievable in, in the locker room after the game because yeah. part of my job was to go down to the locker room with dick lynch the late dick lynch who we all love and miss so much i went to the locker room with dick lynch and it was my job to help grab guests for him as he did his live locker room show well i'm down in the locker room okay when they open it up and before we even started our radio post game show Bob Cratch, who was from Mawa, New Jersey, out of Iowa. He was an offensive lineman. He comes racing over across the locker room, sees me, gives me this huge bear hug. He's dripping wet, wet with sweat. And he gives me a huge bear hug, practically cracking my ribs, screaming, we did it, we did it, we did it, jumping up and down. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, John Bon Jovi comes walking in, and he's celebrating with Johnny Cooks and some of the other giants, Steve Diossi, et cetera, et cetera. It was a pretty cool scene I'll never forget. You have stories all day. I've been around a long time, Lisa. <laughs> you look at the 1990 Super Bowl, and then you look at those later ones, totally exciting too, but different vibes for different reasons, obviously. Yeah, and that's what makes each one different for me. Because the first one of the five Super Bowls that I've been to since covering the team was the only one I got to go as a fan where I bought tickets and I was in the atmosphere of the stadium soaking that all in. It was a really incredible experience being a fan at the game as opposed to the other four giant Super Bowls where I went as a worker, as a member of the media. Yeah. Uh, Super Bowl 25, I was the producer for pre and post. Super Bowl 35, I was writing. I was the uh, secondary Giants writer to Vinnie Detrani of the Bergen Record. And I was writing for, for the Giants Super Bowl. And I was in the press box for that one. For the next Super Bowl, 42, I was with ESPN Radio. And I covered that one for them. Uh, that was ESPN in New York. And I was actually in the upper deck in the auxiliary press box on the corner of the end zone, right opposite the end zone where Burris caught the winning touchdown, but I was on his sideline. And then for the Super Bowl 46, when they beat the Patriots a second time, I was now officially an announcer as part of the pregame and postgame Giants broadcast team. So each one of the Super Bowls has a different vibe for me. For each one, they have their own special reasons why I'm so grateful and appreciative that I got to live through it. Yeah. So in the course of you breaking all that down, you mentioned like 
three other outlets. So you kind of bounced around, but you still stayed in the Giants universe. How did you accomplish that feat? I'd like to think it's because I do good work and because people respected not only what I do in terms of my professionalism and my quality, but, but my flat out knowledge of the team. You know, I, I've always made it my goal to, to think of what the fan wants and what the fan needs to know when I'm doing a broadcast or when I was writing an article. Because we're supposed to be, as the media, the conduit to the fans. And so, you know, it was always a primary, a primary goal of mine to try to do work that was so good, that was so informative, that was so entertaining, that the fans would feel obligated that they would either tune in or read my stuff. Because that's the standard that we should all hold ourselves to. We should, we should make our audience feel like if they don't see or hear what we did, that they miss something good. And, and that's just the way I approach the job. And I'd like to believe that whether it was the Connecticut Radio Network, whether it was MSG, WFAN, ESPN, the Associated Press, or even Sirius Satellite Radio, I'd like to believe that all of those people who have employed me over now what is going to be my 38th straight season of doing Giants football, that they all saw that there was so much value in my work that they felt they had to have me. Yeah. And the Giants media family, it's a close-knit family. I mean, look at our crew. We've been together. I've been part of the crew since 2004 on the FAN side, then since 07 when Giants Radio was brought in sure. house. And it's been the same crew ever since. Well, even since the time that I was brought into the, uh, the Giants broadcast division, you know, um, I was first there, with, you know, with, uh, with WNEW. Then they got sold to Bloomberg Business Radio. Then the Giants went from there to WOR. And then from there, they went to WFAN. So, again, to be able to survive all of these different permutations, it's, uh, I'm very proud of it. And, and you know, Vinny Detrani and I have often talked. Uh, Vinny covered the Giants for 34 years. And I always viewed him as the ultimate Giants reporter. 34 years, that's not as many as 37 or 38. And I, I, that was like what Michael Strahan said when he caught LT's uh, sack record, you know, when he, broke, when, when, when he did what he did. Although, again, there's debate there because LT had rookie sacks in 81 that they don't count. Yeah. I always kind of felt like Strahan catching LT when I was able to catch Vinny Detrani and then pass him. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, well, let's talk some Giants football right now. It's been very lean around MetLife Stadium for a number of years, but we have a new regime. We have a new quarterback. There's a lot of excitement around the team, and that all starts with the NFL draft later this month. What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are, Lisa, that it's been, in my opinion, a three-step plan by Dave Gettleman, the general manager who took over for Jerry Reese. Phase one was to clean out a lot of the toxin or a lot of the things that were not conducive to building a winning team and and whether that meant attitude whether that meant you know players who didn't have enough to get the job done and and other things within the building that was phase one phase two was then to once the cleaning out was done now to start building and start acquiring a new talent base which is what Dave Gettleman started to do these last two drafts and now it's time to start phase three this offseason and between the almost dozen veteran free agents that he signed, which have allowed him to uh, increase the talent level of a number of different roster spots, he now has to go into the draft and kick some big-time butt and have a third consecutive draft that produces results if he's going to get the Giants to keep, continue the schedule that he originally laid out for them. And, you know, with the extra wild card this year in the NFL – all right. I've already seen some computer models that say the Giants are a seven win team right now. Well, that's before the draft. Yeah. If they really do well in the draft, who's to say they can't win eight or nine games and sneak into the playoffs? 
So where do you think Gettleman should go in the draft? Well, there, we'd be here another hour and a half to debate this because there really is a good debate on this one, Lisa. Being that they picked number four overall, they have three logical ways that they can go, and all three of them are good. There's not a bad choice amongst them. They could easily go for an offensive tackle at number four. They could go for an impact player on defense at number four and then go for a red chip offensive tackle in round number two at pick 36. Or they could even trade down maybe a couple of spots from four and then do any of those two permutations, go for the linebacker and then the offensive tackle or go for the offensive tackle and then maybe either go for an impact receiver or if they still think there's a, a good front seven on defense left, they could take one of those at 36. I think all three of those avenues are logical and they make sense and the Giants will come out ahead. Any one of those three, you can't complain. I know you like all three of those options, but which option do you want the Giants to go to? Well, I'm on record as saying I think they should take Isaiah Simmons, the linebacker from Clemson, at number four. Uh, I truly believe that, that he is an impact player who is going to be even better in the NFL because of his skill set than Clemson because they used him in so many different ways. I think they used him in too many different ways. I think if they pare down his playbook a little, he'll be even more dangerous. And so I would go there first, and then I would go for a red chip offensive tackle at number 36, and thereby improving both positions dramatically. And I think there's value in both of the areas where the Giants will pick to where that makes an awful lot of sense to me. Okay. So the NFL draft over the years, recent years, it's been madness. It's been a big overblown event. This year, because of everything, I feel like it's more of a Paul Dottino draft because it's going to be virtual. It's going to be low key, laid back, and all about football. Am I right with that assessment? You'd be right except for one thing. This draft is going to be all techie. And I'm not techie, Lisa. You know that. You know Zoom now. That's it. That's all you have to know. Thanks to you. Uh, I try, and Annie, she helped you too. There you go. Uh, yeah, I, I do believe that this draft, because there have been no off-season visits and no pro days really to speak of, it will require more attention and more detail from the reports that the scouts made during the college season and more tape work that your front office did leading into the draft. Good news for the Giants. Dave Gettleman works as hard as anybody does at studying tape when it comes to the draft. He will not be outworked. There may be somebody who does it as hard as he does, but nobody studies tape more or harder than Dave Gettleman. That should bode well for the Giants. Now, the other area of concern, though, is we have a new regime. We have a coach that was born when you started with the Giants, literally. He's 38 years old. <laughs> and, uh, all Again, making coaches, me feel old. Thank that, you, Lee. Sorry about that. But seriously, we have a new coach. We have all new assistants. They really haven't been able – I know they've been quarantined together in, like, an apartment complex by the Meadowlands – but they haven't been able to do off-season right. camps or any of the legwork that normally comes with the football season. How is that going to impact this new regime? It's going to impact every single team that either change staffs or even just head coaches or just head coaches and coordinators. And to some degree, it's also going to be difficult for teams that change starting quarterbacks. Uh, there's no doubt. These teams are going to be behind the eight ball. How much? We don't know yet because the NFL's calendar is still very fluid right now because of the society that we live in. So it's really impossible to predict how deep those wounds or deep those, those, those sores are going to be as these teams try to formulate what they're going to do with the new personnel that's involved. But there is no question that it's going to be very important for the rookie class, the new coaching staffs, the new quarterbacks. It's going to be very important for those people 
to not only be very astute and smart and detailed, but very aggressive in whatever learning techniques that they can use, whether it's on their electronic pads or their, their computers, their video, they're going to have to really crack the books. And I use the books as an old fashioned term. I'm old school. Okay. Crack the computers, if you will, to, to do everything they can to absorb as much as possible before they finally report. And to that end, Lisa, it's going to be very important that your coaching staff is attentive to detail and they're relentless workers. I think we can tell Joe Judge and his staff are that way just from the initial feelings that we have from meeting them. And it's going to be very important for Dave Gettleman when he drafts the players that he wants and hopefully the guys that he wants also happen to have a great attitude and are football smart. Because it seems to me that the guys who come out of college more ready to go, more ready to be plug and play kind of guys, those are going to be the guys who have a better chance of helping you as rookies than guys who need more coaching. Those guys are going to be left behind a little bit, and maybe they won't even be able to give their teams a lot during their rookie seasons. Yeah. What is your gut feeling, or maybe you've heard, is the NFL going to kick off in September? I don't know, Lisa. I, th I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. I do think this, they'll do everything they can to give the fans a complete season, even if they have to shave something off of training camp or even the preseason. I think they will do everything they can to give the fans 16 regular season games, even if it means delaying it a little bit and pushing it back a few weeks or a month. Uh, I do means, think they're going to try. What if it means playing their games in front of empty stadiums? Well, you know what? I think that's also a possibility too. Again, I think if, if medically speaking, they can get clearance to play the games, they will play them under whatever circumstances are put forth to them because the games are the games. We all know that uh, the games provide a tremendous amount of revenue to the league. And we also know the games provide a tremendous amount of enjoyment to the fans who badly need a distraction these days. Definitely. So finally, Paul, how are you spending quarantine life besides pouring over Giants draft scenarios? I've been doing a lot of that. And I've been doing a lot of tape work on these draft picks, probably not nearly as much as Gell uh, Gettleman has, but I have been looking at these picks, trust me, and, uh, and try to figure out what's going on. I've, I've been doing a lot of my, everybody knows me if you follow me on Twitter, my Nike fives. Some days I've been doing 10 miles instead of only five because there's not a lot to do. And sometimes my daughter comes along with me and we'll do maybe two a day. Uh, you know, got to stay fit. And, and, oh, oh, and a lot of pasta, Lisa. A lot, lot, of, of, lot, of, lot of pasta. That's the official food of quarantine life. But you're also doing Giants work, too, on Giants.com. Well, yes, the Giants uh, Big Blue Kickoff Live program, which goes year-round, 12 months, uh, weekdays, uh, we, have, we have been able to, because of some electronic setups that we were able to put into the hosts' homes, and I'm one of them, Jeff Fiegels, Lance Meadow, uh, and, and, and uh, John Schmelk, our rotating hosts, we were able to use electronic gizmos that allow us not to do the show live with phone calls, because that's the way we usually do the program, but we are now able to tape the shows every day. And then we post them on Giants.com and the Giants phone app, so people can still get their share of Giants talk. And right now we're in the middle of, as we preview the draft, every day we are talking to a media member, whether it be part of the radio team or the TV team of a school, or maybe just a beat writer who covers that team. We've been taking a school every single day as we count down to the draft and we focus in on the prospects and we get detailed information from the guys who cover these players every day to find out as much as we can. And we bring that to the fans on these programs. For example, before I talk to you today, Jeff Eagles and I talked to a gentleman um, from uh, Penn State who covers the Penn State Nittly Lions. And we talked about their handful of prospects and also about Sean Spicer, known as Coach Chaos, the defensive line coach from Penn State who the Giants hired. And we just heard so many marvelous things about him. And so when people listen to these shows, they are getting a, a good prep for the draft. That's so fun. Where can people find the show? 
Well, they can find it at Giants.com. And if they go to the podcast link on Giants.com, then you go through the next screen to Big Blue Kickoff Live. And that's where you can listen to all the shows. They're all archived. So if you missed any of the schools that we previewed in the last couple of weeks, feel free. Go there. You can find it. You can listen to it. We usually try to do at least 20 minutes with an expert from each of the school's hometowns so that we can give you a detailed look on any of the players who might be drafted uh, coming up in the next two weeks. We feel as though that's the best service we could give to the fans. No, you totally are. You're making the quarantine time pass, and that's a jackpot of information for Giants fans. So thank you for doing that. Well, we appreciate uh, everybody for checking us out because uh, we've had tremendous success with the, uh, with the clicks. We have found out that the fan base is very, very happy to have it. We've been doing this now for several years. The only difference is right now we have to do it on tape delay, and it goes up on the site instead of being able to do it live and take phone calls from the fans. But we'll get back to the phone calls once the quarantine's lifted. Yes. Well, Paul, this was so much fun. Thank you so much. Oh, so great to see you again, Lisa. I'm sorry we haven't been able to stay in person. What are you going to do, right? Someday soon. Someday real soon, I hope. I promise. All right. Thanks, Paul. Tell Annie I said bye. And say bye to Lisa. Bye, Lisa. How's your, how are you doing? Because so Paul's daughter is going to be working at the American Dream, which is on hold indefinitely. Uh, what's the status with that? Right now, um, we kind of don't know, kind of it's in limbo at the moment. Um, it looks like they're going to be adding kind of more entertainment versus the retail now. That's kind of like the skeptics. Um, but, you know, we'll see. So all we can do is hope and definitely people come check it out. Can you believe this, Lisa? <laughs> She's going to be working right across the street from me. I would never have thought that in my entire fashion career. <laughs> well, I can't believe that place is finally done. We've been looking at that friggin' eyesore for how many years, Paul, right? <laughs> Your show is right across the street. It's all, it was awful, but it looks beautiful. Now. Yeah, very, very truly. So we just hope for everybody's sake that we can get back to normalcy and all of these things can flourish as they once did before. And in the American Dreams case, at least get a good kickoff going. Exactly. Well, guys, thank you so much. Do you know you were my 17th? podcast interview today oh my goodness you got to get some sleep i have been going since 10 a.m oh my gosh i can't even believe that i'm still like wanting to talk i'm like who's next and i, I can't even believe no one's next but joe gets the other side of the apartment back now so well it's the <laughs> it's the italian blood lisa that's what keeps you going Exactly. Likewise. All right. Paul, I'll talk to you. Annie, I'll talk to you. Keep helping. Bye, Lisa. Take care. <laughs> Bye.